thoughts and they are coming within some short period. I think I'll tell Madam by the time she can, because uh, So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, sir, for the opportunity. So I'll be talking upon retinal detachment in cases of blunt trauma. So the incidence is of, uh, it's equivalent to the 11 to the 40 percent of all the rigmatogenous RD causes are because of the trauma. And out of these, the 80 percent of the traumatic RD is because of the blunt trauma. And out of these, in 28 percent of the myopic RDs, the trauma is a cause and it is because of the giant retinal tears and nasal dialysis. In pediatric cases, it accounts to 3 to 6 percent because of the trauma. And what is the cause is that because of the formed vitreous jelly, there is a uh, cause of delayed retinal detachment in young patients, increased chances of PVR, more chances of macular involvement and therefore the poor visual prognosis. Mechanism of injury, if we say it is a coup, contra coup, and the globe deformation. At the coup, it is the site of the impact, and in the contralateral, it is the contra coup. While the most important is the globe deformation, which is because of the AP anterior posterior compression and decompression, which leads to the disinsertion of the iris root, vitreous base avulsion, choroidal rupture, PVD changes, and the scleral rupture. Usually, these cases present late and only 30% of the patients are diagnosed within a month time. Significant delay is because the patient is young and uncooperative. There are associated systemic inju injuries and the ocular injuries. And sometimes because of the media haze, you cannot see that there is an underlying RD present there. Late diagnosis is because of the opaque media, failure to examine and because of the uncooperative patients. But it is seen that if we diagnose and treat the retinal detachment within the six weeks of time, then there are chances of good visual prognosis. PVR is more commonly seen in younger patients because of the delayed presentation, associate hemorrhage and inflammation. In the closed globe injury, the breaks occur because of the rapid scleral deformation. And this occurs at the site of the injury, that is the direct or it is distant from the site of the injury, that is the indirect impact, which occurs at 180 degrees. And high risk eyes, we all know it is myopes, high myopes, aphakic patients, and with lattice degeneration, and the cases with the fellow eyes with the retinal detachment. So now coming to the breaks which are seen during the blunt trauma. The most common is the dialysis, which is seen in 53% of the cases. And the pathognomic of blunt trauma is the base avulsion. Round breaks are also seen, but it is less commonly seen in cases with the trauma. Horseshoe tear, it is a very rare thing which we see with the traumatic RDs. And if it happens, it occurs at the posterior edge of the dentate or the base or at the edge of the lattice. Giant retinal tears are the second most common cause of the traumatic retinal detachment. And in these cases, usually the PVD is absent. Most important is coming to the history part. We need to see what are the symptoms of the patients. These are the usual symptoms like other retinal detachment cases. Clinical features, as we have already discussed, it is in, seen more commonly in the young patients which have the formed vitreous jelly and no PVD and they usually present slate. So examination, it depends, the visual equity depends upon the location and the associated signs. Pupils should also be always seen and the application tonometry and gonioscopy should always be done in cases of blunt trauma. Evaluation of retina is equally important and remember you should try to avoid scleral depression in cases of trauma. Extraocular motility tests should be done in all the cases. 
and the most important thing is to always assess the uninvolved eye to recognize the unrecognized injuries, medical legal aspect and injury may be an incidental finding. B scan in helps in diagnosing, surgical planning and prognosticating. It uh, tells you about the location, the density and the associated vitreoretinal relationships. This table helps you in differentiating whether this is a case of a posterior vitreous detachment or a retinal detachment. If you see there is a one point attachment, it is usually posterior vitreous detachment while with the RD it is two point attachment. B scan also helps in seeing the foreign bodies which can be seen in cases of occult ruptures. RDs with dislocated cataractus lens or IOLs. CT scan or MRI should always be done to rule out the occult scleral rupture, especially in cases of the flat tire sign where you see the dense subconjunctival hemorrhage with no view of the other features. Treatment modalities depends upon in which stage the patient is presenting you. If it is a po uh, anterior break, you can think of cryotherapy in cases of subclinical RD. Laser retinopexy should be done in cases of the posterior breaks and the adhesions are usually seen within one week of time. Scleral buckling is a primary procedure of choice in such cases because there is no PVD and if there is no evidence of foreign body or vitreous hemorrhage and if the breaks are anterior. Vitrectomy is recommended when there are chances of you are suspecting PVI changes, dislocated lens, associated macular hole, posterior tear or subretinal hemorrhages. Encircling band is advisable along with the vitrectomy when there is larger dialysis, more anterior severe PVR and the inferior breaks. So goals are to clear the media, directly relieve the traction which is pulling the retina, reattach the retina and the tamponading aging. So prognosis is good with the with or without the buccal in such cases. So this is a case of retinal detachment with 270 degree giant retinal tear. The most important step is to see whether the infusion cannula is inside the vitreous cavity or not. And if you see that it is not inside, then you should use the cutter to make an entry into the vitreous cavity. Else, it will land. You will land up in the choroidal effusion. So after this, the routine steps of doing the retinal surgery, flattening the retina and then doing the laser and tamponading it with the silicon oil. This is the case of traumatic RD with macular hole. After, relief, after doing the vitrectomy, in such cases we need to stain the ILM multiple times so that we can recognize all the membranes which are present on the posterior pole. And after relieving the membranes over the posterior pole, we need to just put the PFCL to stabilize the posterior pole and then we should go for the removal of the anterior membranes. Else you will put traction over the posterior pole and sometimes there are uh, chances of creating hydrogenic breaks. So with the cutter or with the forceps, you can relieve the anterior membranes and never hesitate to do a relaxing retinectomy if you are feel that the membranes are not completely removed or even after removing the membrane, the retina is not flattening. So this is a case of traumatic retinal detachment with old case of GRT. The, so there is severe PVR. After removing the fluid, you can see the contracted retina. So the relaxing retinectomy is done. And then the PFCL was, uh, yes, it was stained to remove the posterior membranes. And then PFCL was put so that it can stabilize the posterior pole and rest of the membranes can be removed comparatively easily. So under PFCL, the endolaser is done. And after that, the fluid gas exchange is done and the tamponading is done. So this is the last case of subluxated cataract with the old traumatic retinal detachment. One thing to remember in these cases is before removing the lens or doing the lensectomy using the vitrectomy cutter or the fragmentum, whatever you are planning to, first, re, I mean, make the lens free of all the vitreous so that you are not 
pulling the vitreous or putting traction over the vitreous. So after you have relieved the lens from the vitreous, you can use the phragmatome just to do the lensectomy and then the rest of the steps are the same. So what are the prognostic factors? That there can be a need of, if there is a need of scleral buckle of encircling band, then it is a sign of poor prognostic factor, itrogenic breaks, need of the tamponade, need of lensectomy along with the vitrectomy, what is the entrance wound location, and whether there was a vitreous prolapse or associated endophthalmitis, and if there is any foreign body, then definitely it is the visual prognostic factor for the same. Thank you. in which uh, visual loss is there. The overall reported incidence is 0.9 to 17%. The uh, uh, open globe injury endophthalmitis is worse because th there are a mixed type of organism that depends upon all location where the and settings where the injury occurred. So plus we have to see the comorbidities of the trauma itself. The incubation location is also very, very important. So the, which are factors, they are customized. According to factors, we need to customize the management plan for the cases. So t type of the wound, uh, whether it is a penetrating or globe rupture, or regular, irregular, sharper wound, object of injury that carries the organism, setting of injury. Many of the time of history, can we can tell the when we ask the history patient may be able to tell and we may find some complex uh, organisms IOFB small and large and there are lens abscess intravitreal uh, interval between injury and presentation that is important management plan the wound closure is a primary requirement along with wound closure intravitreal antibiotic injection is very very important with that removal of foreign body if any Presenting vision, we uh, according to that we have to take into the account and management of entry segment. Securing infusion in the vitreous cavity is very very vital. So when it is open globe injury a rupture, we find that uh, even next day of the uh, repair we found that the patient with the endophthalmitis and we need to do a full case with the endophthalmitis that ended up. This open globe injury may cause the lens abscess. Maybe inf uh, infiltration is seen in the lens, but we cannot consider because this all infiltration will also be present into the vitreous cavity. When we open, the, then we realize. So this is the case we, uh, where we had a penetrating injury. And uh, managing the anterior segment Only this much was exudates were there and posti segment was very clear. And this is the case which had a globe rupture. And anti chamber maintainer was very useful tool to uh, tackle this because we are not sure about the even position of the uh, deep uh, longer infusion cannula. So these patients usually, if one once the things are there and anti, if they are responding to antibiotics and inflammation, initially started with the AC maintainer and then later on, uh, infusion cannula was secured. 
this is also a globe rupture but it was a lens abscess we thought that only anterior, side, anterior part of the lens abscess was involved but after removing we could find that it was a full fledged endophthalmitis and we had to perform full vitrectomy and after cataract patient regained good vision this is again a patient we had to remove the entry seg entry segment membrane and then we could find the posterior seg segment inflammation we have done full vitrectomy and patient regained good visual out this is uh, another case of open globe injury uh, we always thought of a uh, lens abscess we had to patient was taken for the traumatic cataract surgery after the removal of the lens we found that there are a lot of infiltration in posterior segments after this large amount of exudates were found so this is the case uh, seven years old female she presented with the no perception of light and uh, after post injection that was the picture we finished the vitrectomy did not find much of a uh, exudates in the vitreous cavity at the end of the one month at the end of one month we patient, we have taken patient for the scleral fixated lens and, uh, this is our special designed lens was used it was scleral tuck lens and uh, this lens is used without uh, glue or without suture and which is self sustaining lens is sustained on the sclera and uh, this patient regained 612 vision at the end of one month this is the intraocular foreign body so to uh, we, we did the study A retrospective data analysis was done for open globe injury, and uh, we have taken from 2008 to 22, and uh, found out the result in our court was 111 cases, and uh, we found significant improvement. And these are the demographics. Wooden stick was the most common cause of trauma. Globe rupture was most common injury, and. Uh, 59.4 percent penetrating injury responsible for endophthalmitis. Eleven point seven percent regain more than 660 vision and 35.7 percent regain 360. And uh, corneal signs, activity during injury, globe rupture, type of intervention, pediatric patient. These are the significant impact on the outcome. So 5.16% was the incidence of endophthalmitis 
and uh, corneal condition was responsible mainly for not improvement revision, good debridement, subconjunctival and intravitreal antibiotic injection may delay or may uh, prevent the endophthalmitis. And this is our uh, Ocular Trauma Society annual meeting to be held at Mahabalipuram, Chennai on 16-17 December. Thank you.
Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to talk on uh, ocular trauma surface that is mainly burns and we all know acid is worse but uh, acid is, it, it, I can tolerate little bit except the hydrochloric acid but alkalis are the curse for the uh, eye, we all know that and it can burn up to posterior segment also. There are lots of classification like Huggies. Roper Hall and newer classification which includes the conjunctival burns also. Uh, when we are dealing with the chemical burns, we have to deal with immediate, acute, early reparative, late reparative and sequelae. So in acute stage chemical burn, the, the in picture we can see conjunctivized lots of inflammation, copious discharge and cornea also, appellation stroma is there. So in this case, we have to have early emergency response with ophthalmic examination, proper examination and proper sit or wash is up at most important. Sometimes we may have to take the support of morning ring. Uh, swipe up the fornix is uh, that is that most thing and pH balance is the important thing. Examine properly for uh, necrosis of the limbal cells. So immediate goal over, over here is promote the epithelial healing, uh, re reduce pain, decrease inflammation and prevent scarring. So whenever there is simple grade one injury, simply antibiotics, topical steroid and topical cyclopelagic works, but you need to call the patient every each, each and other day. When there is grade two to four, we have to, sometime we may have to take support of uh, tetracycline, fluoroquinolone and high dose of vitamin C along with uh, um, soothing drops and uh, again topical steroids sometime we may have to give progesterone steroid also so uh, after doing long list of management we if we done and even in this baby after one month inflammation doesn't subside double evert the lead and look for the res, uh, rest of the particle which is hidden under the superior fornix which we need to remove so whenever there is a uh, burn, there are five stages, uh, surgery with the debridement. Here the goal is restoring the corneal clarity, normalize the ocular surface and prevent glaucoma. So in this baby after three days, um, six days of chemical burn, all the inflammation subside. We did the SLED technique in this patient, so which is a very non, very well non technique. We put the amniotic membrane, we take the uh, Limbal cell transplant from the other eye, we just distribute and we just pour on the amniotic membrane and then we can again put the glue on that. This is slat technique is very well known to be to correct for the chemical burn. So this is a th seventh day post-op and later on after three months gets the clarity of vision which is published in IGO. So this is another few cases of the slat technique. But whenever there is a chemical burns in the conjunctiva, look for the diplopia, uh, maybe because simply because due to simblepharon, so simblepharectomy excision along with the sometime AMG is up at most important. So you have to release complete scar of the uh, tissue and then put the amniotic membrane graft. So after three months, the revision gets clear. In, especially in babies, we just put central hall in the cornea to prevent the amblyopia. So when we look for the lead socket, lacrimal area and orbit for the chemical injury, in lead we have to take sometimes support of skin specialist along with whenever there is a thermal burn associated with that. So let the lead edema subside and then usually patient comes with ptosis that is mainly because of simblepharon. Again, so in this patient also we did simblepharectomy along with the mucous membrane graft. So that uh, works very well after this and the cornea gets clear. Sometimes strabismus also comes because of simblepharon and because of uh, deep alkali burn. So in this patient, muscle had lots of adhesion. We just uh, wrap, wrapped it with non-absorbable material and then uh, put, put the uh, glue. 
Sometimes patient comes with entropion, simple entropion correction and tracheosis. So ciliary bed transfer we can do whenever there is a tracheosis. There are a lot many newer techniques like anterior lamellar uh, recession. Also nowadays people are doing for tracheosis. Uh, so here we just uh, put the whole ciliary bed anteriorly and that is uh, less chances of recurrence of this tracheosis. So once you clear that, the cornea gets clear. Uh, sometimes mucous membrane graft along also when there is a lots of keratinization uh, as a sequelae of burn we may have to put the mucous membrane graft. When there is a tracheosis of upper lid entropion and then the posterior lamella with cantrotomy box. Tracheosis with upper lid entropion reason for uh, circus deformity here is uh, 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 posterior uh, shortening so volume augmentation also sometimes works. Sometimes patient comes for the enchyloblepharon just release the enchyloblepharon and treat amblyopia, cicatricial ectropion that will mainly lead to lack of thermos so simple tarsography can sometimes work or sometimes we may have to do skin grafting along with the tarsography. So whenever there is entropion length then the posterior lamella, ectropion remove the cicatrix and skin graft, tracheosis, ciliary bed transfer or anterior lamella. Uh, recession and uh, whenever there is lead defect correct accordingly when we go into orbit there can be orbital trauma which can lead to uh, fornix like shallow fornix shelled fornix obliterated fornix wet contracted socket or dry contracted socket and the, again we have options available are amniotic membrane after removal of the releasing the scar in this uh, orbit so in this patient also we have done mucous membrane graft after releasing the scar which was burned by uh, chemical burns uh, alkali mucous membrane graft and then you can just properly fit the prosthesis fornix formation is at most important in such kind of patient and we may have to take support of uh, again skin graft to fit the proper prosthesis and uh, again fornix reconstruction with amg can be done but don't forget to put fornix forming sutures and say or simple on ring or uh, sometimes simple confirmer if something is not uh, everything is not available in this baby we did volume augmentation with dermis fat graft along with canthotomy and uh, mucous membrane graft and then we can give a little bit gratifying result but this kind of patient is definitely needs experts uh, and multiple team approach to treat so i'll not just go into detail of the lacrimal area burn we have devised newer technique and which is already published but then again whenever there is a lacrimal uh, area burn uh, thorough wash but no syringing because you are just pushing the chemical again into the sac so don't do this conjunctivo dcr is the approach probing with bicanalicular intubation and probing with modified pigtail which is our own technique can be done and lacrimal sac we can just do intracath dcr skin root or conjunctival root so in conclusion multidisciplinary approach at the same time multiple surgeries and poor prognosis and take care of the legal issues. Thanks to my patients, thanks to my teachers, and thank you for patient listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shah. It was a wonderful presentation and some, these are difficult scenarios to handle and uh, many times you must be doing multiple surgeries for a single case. Yes, and. Uh, uh, in our tribal area, the most important part is uh, the father and mother send a baby to get the tuna packet. So I'm yeah. really grateful to now OTSI because they have done some government licensing and now they have banned tuna packet, not banned tuna packet, but they don't give to children and they have double, they have promised to double wrap the tuna packet. So at least that much action. Yeah, and for that, I would <laughs> like to congratulate uh, Dr. Mehul Shah Thank for you. this. He has done a lot of efforts and uh, I mean, the whole team has done it, but he has led from the front and uh, that that is wonderful thank you very much sir yeah 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 okay dr rajasina sir will highlight about the corneal injury uh, Corneal injuries, uh, the ocular trauma, it happens mostly in children. But uh, as it happens in school or playground or at home, but it happens also in adults. And that happens, say, in road traffic accident or at the workplace. These are the two places for adults. And uh, this was one study which we published long back uh, in 2002. It 
was started in the pediatric of Dr. Hawaii, India. And we found out that the majority of the injuries were, uh, uh, they happened because of unsupervised sports. And this study was done in the later half of the, of the year. And that's why bow and arrow injuries are uh, very common, were most found to be very common during this period. Then another study which uh, uh, concluded that uh, it is the unsupervised sports that gives rise to trauma to eyes, present particularly. So as far as uh, spectrum of coronal injury is concerned, it can be divided into coronal abrasion, coronal perforation, coronal foreign body, and temporal injury of the cornea. So I'll be de dealing a little bit about all these. So when you have a coronal abrasion, the patient is in severe pain because the nerves get exposed and you can immediately confused and uh, you have to manage the patient by simply lubricants, antibiotics, patching, you can put a BCL, you can do patching, but you have to be careful that it does not get infected. That's the most important thing because if it gets infected by the commensals in the uh, uh, corneal surface, the ocular surface, then uh, it can cause uh, permanent damage to the eye, cause, cause scarring. As far as coronal laceration is concerned, it is seen in about 7 to 14 percent of cases. Uh, it is about 7 to 14 percent of all of the traumatic injuries. And uh, the place of injury can be home, uh, or playground, school, children. Uh, many times they get their eyes injured uh, with uh, pencils, etc. And uh, the, uh, there are various spectrum of presentation. If you have a corneal laceration, and, uh, which is partial thickness, then you just have to see whether the edges are in a pulse or not. If they are at post and it's partial thickness, you can just leave it like that. Maybe you can put a bandage for that. But if the edges are in a pulse, then you have to oppose it by putting a suture. Uh, all these surgeries should be done with the general anesthesia because by putting local anesthesia, you, can, you increase the surrounding pressure. So the risk of damage is more, and the the uh, uh, cornea and scleral wood is repaired first before we actually repair any adnexal injury, blade injury, or etc. As far as corneal uh, repair is concerned, uh, the suture that is used is steno monofilament nylon suture. For limbus, again, you use a steno monofilament nylon suture. For sclera, you use. Uh, 6 uh, polyglectin that is lateral suture. For Penyantaiwa, you use 8 o polyglectin that is 8 o lateral suture. This is the normal practice that we follow. There can be some modification in that. Uh, when you have a corneal perforation, the first thing is to identify the anatomical landmarks. So there are certain la landmarks like one is limbus, which is very important, the most important landmark. And then of course, wherever there is an angulation, you have to take care of that. And it is sometimes difficult to decide how many sutures, so this compression triangle gives you an idea. So this compression triangle is about, these zones have a triangular configuration. And uh, one half of the suture length is the compression of compression zone on either side of the suture. So you create a triangle and see that in between these two sutures, if this point meets, this means that, uh, this means that the uh, number of sutures is adequate. So it shouldn't be uh, like uh, the one point is here and the other is here. It should at least be meeting. Uh, the central sutures, if you are doing a full corneal repair, then the central suture should bite should be small because you don't want to create large uh, uh, size uh, suture related scars. So that is uh, an important issue. When you have an angular corneal wound, you secure the angle first and then repair. And in a select population, you use this first ring suture of Eisner methods, which is very effective. If you have a prolapsed iris, up to 24 to 36 hours, you can still manage, you wash it with antibiotics, then if there is any membrane formed over it, remove that, and you can replace it. But if it's more than 48 hours, 48 or more than 48 hours, then in that case, it, it is always preferable to excise the, uh, the iris, and see to it, if you can manage, you can manage to dissect a little bit and remove a thin layer of the iris and leave the posterior thin layer. That, that is also doable uh, with practice. 
because if you uh, replace the same iris which is collapsed for 48, 72 hours, or 4 days, 5 days, then the risk of infection going into the eye is very high. The risk of metastomitis is high. So this is a case wherein uh, there is a perforation, there is an iris prolapse. So whenever you are doing a repair, make a paracentesis, inject viscal acid from paracentesis. Don't use this one. And then keep injecting hyperscosic viscal acid and bring the uh, uterine tissue back to its position. And then if it's a small perforation, you can just put a central suture and then two sutures adjacent to it and that will complete the repair. If it's a larger one, then you may start from the edge that is at the limbus and then the two limbus are secured first so that anatomical landmarks are secured and then you go ahead and complete the suture. So this is how you complete it. Now if it's a corneal sphere perforation as I was mentioning, the, as I said the first and foremost thing is that you should remove these uh, the fluff tissue do the pentomy to see how much is the extent of the spheral injury. And then the first thing is landmark you have to ensure or align is limbus because this white to white zone, once you align that, that means that you have perfectly aligned the uh, anatomy of uh, the eye. Because limbus alignment means that the, this part would be cornea, that part would be sclera, and both sides of the injury are well aligned. And then you put one suture at one side of the uh, injury, one side of the wound. Then you put on the other side. Then you keep bisecting it. This is what you do. So uh, you put one suture here, then you put in the center, and then you bisect here. Then after that you bisect here. Then you keep bisecting, and then you put spiral sutures. And if needed, you have to put a muscle hook to go to look for the extent of the damage that has happened in the sphere in order to secure the whole of the sphere wound completely. And this is the general procedure. Uh, if there is a tissue loss, if there is a corneal perforation, there is a tissue loss, you can, if it's a very small tissue loss, you can put a glue, you can put a fibrin glue or a cyanide glue over it. You can also put a nodding membrane, but if it's a larger tissue loss, then in that case you may have to do a patch around. And post-operatively, patch or shield is put, uh, topical cordyceps, steroid, antibiotic, hydrophagics are done. And suture removal should be done at about six weeks. If we have a coronal foreign body, then it needs to be removed. You can simply remove on slit lamp. You just put a uh, put paracane on top and uh, anesthetize the cornea and then remove the foreign body. One thing I would like to uh, tell you and emphasize that when you remove a metallic foreign body, you have a lot of rust surrounding that. That also needs to be removed. You should never leave the rust, otherwise it will lead to, it can lead to infection, it can lead to non-healing, it can lead to inflammation, all sorts of things. So the rust along with foreign body has to be removed. Uh, just a few uh, uh, things about chemical injury because that is also a part of the coronal injury. Uh, you can have acute chemical injury because of acid or alkali or whatever. The most important thing is that uh, you have to remove the chemical. So for removing the chemical, you have to irrigate the uh, eye of the surface. And you have to irrigate to such an extent that you have to bring back the normal pH of the ocular surface. So the normal, uh, normally what we do, we put uh, paracane in the cul-de-sac, and then uh, after that, put a speculum, and then do a thorough wash. Ask the patient to look up, down, right, left, and keep washing. It is said that you keep washing for 30 minutes, but ideally you wash, you evert the lid, and once you have done the wash, wait for five minutes, and then look for pH. Don't immediately look at the pH, otherwise you'll get the pH of the solution which you have washed. So wash it, wait for five minutes, and then match the pH, and if it is seven, this means that your seven, seven point two, this means that your uh, wash is complete. And then uh, you also should look for the particulate matter. So a double eversion should be done. So single eversion, a double eversion, and you should look for the particulate matter. In case there is particulate matter there, you have to remove it. As far as washing is concerned, you can wash with uh, uh, 
VSS, you can wash with ringer lactate, you can wash with even tap water. Whatever you are getting, if it's a clean water, wash with it because you shouldn't want, you, you, sh you shouldn't delay the, this act of washing because otherwise uh, it will keep on causing damage to the optic surface. And then of course you promote a visualization. Once you have done the wash, the immediate management is done. And then after that you have to assess how much is the damage, how much is the pillar defect, how much is the is the liberal ischemia, and based on that, uh, you have to uh, repair. You have to deprive the necrotic material and uh, uh, put the patient on uh, topical medications like oscorbate, nitrate, uh, then systemic doxycycline, antibiotic. Antibiotic, which is uh, most effective friendly, like chronophenicol, because you are not treating infection, you are just providing it for prophylaxis. And then, of course, topical cyclophilic and topical steroid for at least for two weeks. That is essential because uh, you have to suppress the collagenolytic activity by putting topical steroid. And you should also check if there is some embedded uh, material, something like Suna particle. If it is embedded inside subconjunctively, then you should dissect the conjunctiva and then remove it. Otherwise, it will cause melting of the underlying sphera. It's very essential to remove particulate matter even from underlying and, uh, under the conjunctive and then put an amniotic membrane. Amniotic membrane is a very useful tool to not only to promote visualization but also to reduce pain in the eye. So this is how you put, you line the whole of ocular surface, the bulb of conjunctiva, the palpable conjunctiva, put a phonic forming suture so that you have conjunctival uh, amniotic membrane lining all over. That is the most important thing. And this is one study which we had done uh, at our center that amniotic membrane transplantation in acute chemical injury does reduce pain in the patient significantly and also promotes the visualization. So in conclusion, ocular trauma is more common in children, but it can, it can also happen in adults. Particularly, as I said, uh, workplace injury is a common, particularly in factories, etc. Chemical injury which can happen in workplace. That is that may be seen in adults. In children, unsupervised sport is something which is uh, uh, a common cause for uh, ocular injury. And uh, most important thing is that we have to understand that this is an ocular emergency, so we have to treat the patient promptly and uh, explain to the uh, to the patient, to the relatives, that multiple interventions will be required in order to bring uh, about a good visual rehabilitation. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Any suggestion or comments will be... Wonderful, sir. Uh, I think you uh, highlighted this uh, important part which everybody should understand because everybody will keep getting the all emergency cases and these are very important tips which will be helpful to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Purendra is not available, so we end this session and next session people can take over.